So when introducing a, a highly distinguished speaker like Dr. Mann, you would very occasionally hear a speaker referred to as a scholar and a gentleman. But in Doug's case, these two phrases are particularly applicable, and it's actually hard to say which of these accolades comes first in order since he excels in both domains of life. Doug served as chief of cardiology for over 10 years and is currently the Lewin Distinguished Professor of Cardiovascular Disease and Professor of Medicine, Cell Biology, and Physiology at Washington University School of Medicine. He received his medical degree from Temple University and completed fellowships in cardiology at UCSD and Massachusetts General. He's held important leadership positions at several other distinguished institutions in the US. Doug is the founding editor of the Heart Failure Compendium to Brownwald's textbook on heart disease. He was uh, co-editor of the 11th edition of Brownwald's Heart Disease, and he's the founding and current editor of Jack Basic to, Transla Basic to Translational Science, which we've seen several papers referenced uh, today. Um, Doug receives, uh, has received numerous prestigious awards in, uh, for his contributions from the ACC, AHA, and a Lifetime Achievement Award from HFSA, the society for which he was also uh, past president. Doug's research interests, among others, has included the molecular and cellular basis of heart failure, the role of inflammation and immunity in disease progression, and most relevant to this symposium, he has been a leading figure in the field of heart reverse remodeling recovery and a new concept that he introduced, that of myocardial remission. Among Doug's many achievements and contributions is his exceedingly important role as a mentor. He has directly trained over 50 fellows over his career, many of whom have, also have themselves gone on to hold prestigious positions at leading institutions around the world. And in addition, many of us here today, including me and many others in the field, have our own stories of how Doug has selflessly contributed to our career development, and Doug, we're very indebted to you for that guidance. Over recent years, Doug has devoted a lot of effort to understanding the impact of hemodynamic loading and unloading on myocardial properties, in particular the molecular signatures and mechanisms of how load influences muscle function and genotype. And today, Doug is gonna to talk to us today about the role of hemodynamic load in left ventricular remodeling and reverse remodeling. Thank you for joining us today, Doug. begin by thanking Dan for <clears throat> inviting me to speak and then the overly generous uh, introduction. Um, so my, my talk today is really focused on, on how load uh, affects cardiac structure and function and in particular how unloading um, uh, also affects it. Uh, so the first part of the talk is really just on the concept about how load affects structure and function. And actually, in preparation for this, I actually went back to my, my first study that I ever did. So when I think about remodeling, um, I think about uh, really three components. The first is the changes in the myocyte. The second is the change in the myocardium. And by that, I mean the number of myocytes as well as the extracellular matrix. And then the third thing is how all this uh, sums up together to affect cardiac uh, geometry. So in preparing for this, I actually went back. This is the first study I ever did, which was 30 years ago, which is really incredibly scary. Well, my hair was not gray then. Um, it's all gray now, and it's all because I've been thinking about myocytes all these years. But this is actually a simple study that I did as a postdoc, where what we did was actually take adult cardiac myocytes, isolated them, put them in culture, and then just stretch them. This seems like a really simple experiment, but it took about six months to figure out how to stretch them and actually demonstrate that you're actually getting a stretch or an increase in load. We looked very simply at uridine incorporation as a measure uh, of RNA synthesis, and then phenylephrine incorporation into the cytoplasm as a measure of protein synthesis. And as shown here, you're able to actually see an increase in RNA synthesis and, and protein synthesis. Uh, Sego Zumo then took this model uh, and then and really just did the, the whole study much more elegantly than I ever could have. But the, this was actually the, the first demonstration actually in an adult myocyte that just adding load to the cell would actually activate it to hypertrophy. So the question is, how does all this happen? A number of labs now have reduplicated this work and gone on and shown that stretch alone is sufficient to activate a variety of growth pathways. And we normally think about this sort of traditional paradigm when you think about an agonist binding to a receptor, activating signal transduction, leading to gene expression, 
uh, and uh, cardiac remodeling. Well, as it turns out, you can get the, uh, the same actual thing here with stretch. And although the exact stretch receptors uh, are not known, as I'll show you on the next slide, you can actually uh, activate a number of uh, receptors. We don't know what the exact stretch receptor is, but they are hardwired into a variety of different signal uh, transduction cascades uh, that can lead to adverse uh, cardiac remodeling. So this is a cartoon from Tom Force, and it just shows you that there are a number of different pathways that can be activated by simple stretch, both through integrins, ion channels, the sodium hydrogen exchanger, and, and it's also known when myocytes are stretched, they elaborate a variety of proteins that they can, uh, can then uh, feed back into the cell in an autocrine and paracrine fashion and also drive a signal transduction. So load in and of itself is sufficient to drive hypertrophic programs within cardiac myocytes. This is just a cartoon of the G-alpha-Q signaling pathway, which is one of many signal transduction pathways that are activated by stretch. And in this case, what I'm going to do is just show you some data that if you overexpress a single component of a pathway that's activated by stretch, you can actually recapitulate a, a, a hypertrophic uh, gene program. So these are data from uh, Gerald Dorn's lab where they just overexpressed G-alpha-Q, which again is a, a single component of a stretch activated pathway. And as shown here, you can get dramatic cardiac hypertrophy uh, just by a single upregulation of a signaling cascade component. So as it turns out, uh, if you overstretch cardiac myocytes and overload cardiac myocytes, you get a complete change in the cardiac biology of, uh, of myocytes, including alterations in calcium signaling, growth, extracellular matrix coupling, as well as the energetics. And that's just sort of shown here in cartoon form. Virtually all components of cardiac myocyte signaling uh, are uh, impacted by overload. It's not a single gene. Uh, it's not a single pathway. It, it all happens together. So the question is, how does all this summarize uh, and lead to alterations in cardiac geometry? And, and this is sort of something that I think we've gotten wrong for about 20 years. We're beginning to get it right now. But this is the uh, traditional paradigm that's been handed down to medical students and uh, cardiac fellows since the beginning of time. And this is sort of the pattern that I inherited too. Shown here are the typical hypertrophy pathways. You can get concentric hypertrophy or concentric remodeling where there's no increase in mass, but there's just a decrease uh, in the chamber. The typical concentric hypertrophy pathway is what we see uh, in uh, pressure overload. And the typical eccentric pathway, which we see classically in volume overload, but it's been also sort of taught to us that uh, there's this transition from concentric hypertrophy into eccentric hypertrophy. And I think this has really messed up the field for a lot of years because it's not what really happens in people, despite the fact that you'll see it in every single textbook of cardiac pathophysiology. If you look back to where all this came from, the earliest I can trace it back is into Meerson's early studies going back to 1962. And what they did was to do a transaortic valvular constriction, acute valvular constriction, fairly significant. And they noticed in about 20 to 30 percent of the rabbits and the dogs that they did that they would get this progression from cardiac hypertrophy into failure. And that's really what set the whole stage for 20 to 30 years of molecular biology. And the pathway that I'm going to show you here, this is what's actually in textbooks. If you, there was, somebody showed a, a slide from Joe Hill's New England Journal paper where they show this classic transition from compensatory hypertrophy into cardiomyopathic dilatation. And we've spent millions of dollars trying to study this and then translate it back to human heart failure. The problem is, is that it really doesn't exist uh, in humans, and that's only become knowledgeable recently when you start to go look at epidemiology studies. And these are just two of many papers now that show if you really look at cohorts of people, the so-called concentric hypertrophy or HEF-PEF, that less than 10% of these people actually translate to a, a, a dilated cardiomyopathy. So the whole concept of using extreme pressure overloads to produce eccentric hypertrophy as a way to understand the biology of uh, cardiac remodeling is probably not clinically relevant. I'm not saying the biology is wrong, I'm just saying is it probably has no impact at all on what we understand about human heart failure. So this is Dan Drazner's nice summary in circulation, and what he shows here is that in, in hypertension, the classic pressure overload, that there are some patients who transition acutely to a low cardiac EF. It's a very small percentage. The great majority of them will have a myocardial infarction that will drive this phenotype. 
He also shows here that the more classic phenotype of concentric left ventricular hypertrophy, that the majority of patients only get to a low EF if they have an intercurrent myocardial infarction. So the width of the arrows here shows the frequency of the event. Uh, and that very few people with no demonstrable cardiac injury actually transition from concentric hypertrophy into a low EF. So the real question then begins, how do you actually get to eccentric hypertrophy from this phenotype? How does it actually occur, or does it even occur? And so I'm fortunate to work with a really talented group of cardiac surgeons or animal physiology surgeons and, and imagers at uh, WashU, and they developed a really unique model where they combined a very small apical infarct with a very low moderate pressure overload. And when they put both of those together, uh, they can actually get profound cardiac remodeling. And we've sort of modified this model to use it to look at reverse remodeling. But I just want to uh, briefly show you the utility of this model. So this is what sort of the uh, end diastole and end systole look like at one day. And uh, over time, the, uh, the mouse uh, heart will actually undergo profound cardiac remodeling. And it's because there's increased um, uh, cardiac remodeling within the infarct zone. When you look at this uh, model, you notice that the small infarct has no impact on cardiac remodeling. The small pressure overload has no effect on cardiac remodeling, but the two together are synergistic. And that's shown here. So the TAC plus MI model is shown by the blue dot. So if you look at end diastolic volume, TAC alone, MI alone, no change in either end uh, diastolic or end systolic volume. If you then look at the ejection fraction, they're relatively stable. Uh, again, the TAC plus MI model, uh, there's actually a deterioration in ejection fraction. And then if you look at the systolic wall motion index, which is really the amount of akinetic muscle, that increases over time, which is consistent with infarct expansion. So low pressure overload and a small cardiac injury together are synergistic and lead to profound cardiac remodeling. Uh, this is, again, further data from the study. What they show here is that Left ventricular collagen is not increased a great deal right here. That's shown here. With the TAC-MI, you get a very small amount, but synergistically, you get a great deal in heart failure. Similarly, with BNP, there's a small rise in BNP, but if you combine the two together, uh, it's synergistic. So when I came to WashU, this model had sort of already been out there, and I was uh, we'd been doing a lot of genetic studies with turning on transgenes and then turning them off and looking at reverse remodeling, and I realized that that wouldn't provide a really useful model to study cardiac remodeling because it was entirely dependent on the transgene. So I asked the core um, if they could uh, then uh, unban these animals and we could study reverse remodeling. So just in summary, a small apical infarct alone doesn't lead to remodeling, pressure overload doesn't, but load acts synergistically with tissue injury to provoke LV remodeling. And the question is, how does this occur? And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it today, but the concept is, is that in response to tissue injury, you activate a variety of inflammatory responses. And it's really the uh, inflammation that comes with a tissue injury that allows the matrix to what I refer to as a permissive matrix. It's high in MMPs and initially low uh, in TIMPs. And these two uh, modalities combined then can then lead to a permissive myocardium and hemodynamic load allow for LV dilatation and LV wall thinning. But you have to have, the matrix has to be primed uh, to receive that load signal. And that usually is driven by uh, MMPs, although neurohormones can do the same thing. So um, this begs the question then, how do you actually undergo reverse remodeling? And this is actually an interesting question, which I've spent a lot of nights thinking about. If you think about drug therapy, it's actually probably the biology that gets better first, and then the heart gets smaller. Uh, for the purpose of uh, this symposium today, it's obviously mechanical unload can also lead to reverse remodeling. And the two together are also very synergistic. If you put drugs on top of hemodynamic load, you get even more profound remodeling. So as I said, I, I asked the core if they could then take this model that they had so uh, elegantly developed, and I said, well, can you also unband these mice? So it's a second surgery, and they were uh, kind enough to do this, and I'll just show you some data from this and then use this as a platform to talk about unloading and maybe things we got to think about at the symposium. So this just shows the protocol. The mice undergo the TAC and MI. Within uh, two weeks, there's a significant amount of um, uh, hemodynamic remodeling, as I showed you. Uh, we then deband the mice here, and as shown here, after debanding, you completely restore the pressure gradient across the aortic valve to normal. 
And these are the data, these are the core data from the unloading experiment. So you can see here, if you look at end diastolic volume, in the mice uh, that are uh, TAC plus MI, they continue to remodel. If you then unload them at two weeks, the end diastolic volumes <coughs> return almost to normal. Same thing if you look at end systolic volumes. If you look at the R to H ratio, so the walls continue to uh, thin here and they resume normal R to H ratio. And with ejection fraction, this is the one part of the model that's not a great part of the model, not a perfect part. The ejection fraction continues to go down and there's a trend towards a significant improvement in the ejection fraction in the mice. So now you have a mouse model of, I think, uh, that mimics uh, Western society in that it's pressure overload and tissue injury leading to remodeling and you can get uh, a fairly significant reverse remodeling. If you then just go look at histology in the mice, you get a complete reversal uh, of cardiac myocyte hypertrophy in these mice. Surprisingly, the uh, collagen area fraction really didn't decrease in the mice and we've seen this also in the transgenics. And I think the reason is, is that collagen remodeling takes months uh, and we're really looking over a period of weeks. Nonetheless, function improves in these mice. So we, like others, did uh, transcriptional profiling, and these kinds of graphs are always, I think, confusing to people who aren't used to looking at them. In the left-hand panel are uh, PCA plots. What PCA does is it takes all the variability in your data and it crunches it down uh, into sort of compact units. So if you focus here, um, we looked at um, gene transcription at two weeks, and you can see if you just look at the heart failure in red, the heart failure debanded in blue, and then the sham animals, that these circles, the heart failure and the, the D-banded are really, they cluster together. In contrast, if you go another two weeks and let the transcriptional program change, what happens is, is that the uh, heart failure mice um, uh, shown in red here now are clearly separated from the D-band mice. So over time, the transcriptional profile does change. So what we did here was to look at genes that were either normalized, and there were only 425 that were normalized early on. In contrast, about 2,000 genes are normalized if you go another two weeks. So the longer you unload, the more the transcriptional profile goes back to normal. Another interesting part of this are these so-called persistently dysregulated genes. These are genes that, despite unloading, really don't go back to normal. Uh, so there are about 800 of these uh, at two weeks and about 500 of these um, uh, at uh, four weeks of unloading. So the next thing we did was to try to break this down into some digestible bites. And, and again, we went back to our myocyte cartoons. So we looked at the matrix, we looked at the integrins, we looked at sarcomeres, we looked at energetics, and we looked at calcium handling. Just to simplify this, the two-week mice are shown here and the four-week D-band are shown here. And the leftmost hand column here are the reverse genes, and the parallax arrow here is pretty wicked. I can't really see them. If you note at two weeks, there are a lot of genes that aren't reversed. The ones that are reversed are mainly myocyte genes, so contractility genes. And the genes that really don't are persistently dysregulated out at two weeks are the collagen genes. If you now go over to four weeks, you can see that almost all the genes that are reversed are genes that are involved in excitation contraction coupling, as well as energetics. And most of the collagen genes have now uh, gone back and reversed. So this is a nice time-dependent way uh, of looking at uh, uh, cardiac uh, uh, remodeling, at least at the transcriptional level. The last thing <coughs> that we did, and this is really, we had a great informatics guy, is we superimposed all these data uh, onto an ingenuity pathway analysis, which usually to me, it looks like a spaghetti diagram of nothing. But we forced the genes into five what we call canonical pathways, including some metabolism, a matrix. And the interesting thing here is if you look at the genes that are reversed, um, they're not all the same color. And what this implies is if the gene was simply turning on and turning off, they would all be regulated together. What you see here is uh, actually that the different gene families are regulated to a different degree, and this implies that genes are networked in some way. The interesting thing here, though, I think, is the persistently dysregulated genes. If you look in this column uh, here, you see that some are actually overexpressed compared to what they were before. And what this implies to me is that when the heart remodels, it comes back to something that looks like it's normal, but it comes back to a different set point. Uh, and this different set point is time dependent and I think what I'm going to try to suggest is you can actually tune the amount of remodeling by the kind of unloading you do. We don't have good ways to pick this up, 
But this, I think, is a, a, a tunable event. So uh, just in summary, hemodynamic unloading, at least in this model, leads to reverse remodeling that's accompanied by normalization of structure and partial no normalization of function. And hemodynamic loading leads to reversible changes in gene expression that govern myocyte function. And that actually precedes the changes in the matrix. And that, that makes sense. You can't really get smaller unless the engine is making the, the heart smaller. And that the normalized incident heart failure genes and the persistently dysregulated genes don't return to the same set point. What does that mean? The answer is I don't know exactly, but there's some really interesting concepts about how the heart or how organs respond to stress. This is um, a really interesting paper on the theory of biological robustness. As a physiologist, I was taught about homeostasis. And it turns out that, that biologic systems really uh, are, were designed to be able to withstand stress and, and to maintain function. Homeostasis is about returning to normal, whereas robustness is about being able to maintain function despite an adverse environment. So robustness allows biological systems to maintain function against internal and external perturbations. And robustness is concerned with maintaining function, keeping the heart contracting. It doesn't hear how it gets there. It just wants to keep function. Whereas homeostasis is really focused in on returning uh, to normal. So also from the same papers, this concept of what robustness is. And these are sort of uh, two steady states. The first one is if you imagine a perturbation here, and this can be Naveen's acute myocardial infarction that you unload, what happens is the system gets pushed to an outer limit here, but then is allowed to go back to the center, and, and that's sort of a homeostatic response. Uh, and in that case, the heart would sort of look, the genes would look the same, the structure would look the same, and the function would look the same. I think what happens in chronic heart failure, where the heart's dilated for a prolonged period of time, uh, and then comes back to normal, is it transitions from the so-called steady state here to a separate steady state, uh, and although this state functions, it's, it's able to function, it's actually a different biologic properties. And this has a lot to do with why I think hearts, when they get stressed a second time, they don't do as well, and why sometimes when we take VADs out of patients, they'll then decompensate. It's because the system is really designed to maintain function, but it's not designed to take uh, a second hit. And there are two real theories for uh, why this might occur, this steady state uh, might occur. The first one comes from Jim Weiss's uh, so-called multiple good enough solutions. This is sort of the prevailing theory where when a system is stressed, how it comes back together. And what Jim Weiss shows in this review article is that if you just take the lobster and you look at gastric motility in the lobster, the lobster can use a variety of different ion channels to give you the same physiological readout. So this is sort of uh, gastric motility one, you can call it gastric motility two. Uh, and you can see that they're both give you the same function, but they do it by different combinations of ion channels and calcium channels. So the concept is here that you don't need one way of doing it, you can do it multiple ways. And then what uh, Jim Weiss went on to do is develop this concept of epigenes. So if you look at uh, genes, that they're organized together in modules, <clears throat> and that's shown here. Each module he calls an epigene, and the concept here is you could lose epigene one and epigene two, but the system would still learn to function together. So in this model, how it all comes back together, to me at least, sort of seems uh, somewhat random. Um, he does acknowledge that uh, all solutions are not the same and that some are better, but to me that the concept is that it's random. There's another concept out there about highly optimized tolerance or HOT, and that's where systems are designed to take a hit and still function. That's that concept of robustness, but they're not optimized to take a, a second hit. And this becomes important if you're trying to think about optimal ways of unloading and, and ways to do it sort of more scientifically than we're currently doing. So I think what, what happens, at least in chronic heart failure, is that acutely you're able to come back, but chronically you end up going to a new steady state. And as I said, this steady state can be tuned. You can probably, and we haven't done these studies, no one's done them yet, but depending on how you unload the ventricle and maybe the, the drugs that you give, you can achieve uh, different levels of steady state that maybe range somewhere in between uh, um, uh, homeostasis and then something that can't take a second hit. Again, this is all hypothetical, but, but Dan asked me to do something that was sort of out there a little bit. So um, just sort of think about LV uh, reverse remodeling. I, I showed this cartoon at the Gordon Conference recently. And so I think with remodeling, if you basically unload the heart, you also will unload neurohormonal activation. 
And as I showed you, this leads to changes in the myocyte biology. Uh, and then I think the changes in the myocardium uh, follow that secondary, at least that's what our gene transcription uh, data tell us. And these two together will actually lead to reverse remodeling. But it's important to not forget about the myocardium. So when we think about ways to unload the heart, we're really focused in on myocyte biology. But if, if the myocardium, if there's still a lot of MMP activation, then that heart, the minute it gets loaded, it's going to expand again. So I think as we go forward as a field, we need to think about both concepts here. So just sort of these are questions. I wanted to finish up a little bit early and leave plenty of time for questions. So I think we as a field spend a lot of time pondering about the optimal methods for hemodynamic unloading and probably not enough time on what's being unloaded. The first thing, and I think no one would disagree, is dead meat, don't beat. I think when you take a vat out of a, a horribly ischemic ventricle that's got no myocytes, there's no hope of recovery. But then also, you know, Dan's elegant work has shown that optimizing background therapy probably does matter. We're applying heart failure rules here. We use the same drugs at the same doses. I don't think we really have a clue whether that's the best way. It's a rational way, but I don't think anybody really knows. And is there an ideal set point for reverse remodeling with hemodynamic unloading? If you sort of take these concepts of steady state one, steady state two, there are probably a number of different ways we could get to a new set point, but we have to understand what uh, is a robust set point that would allow you to begin to do uh, unloading. And then the real question is, how do you measure this? If you just look at structure and function, the work we've done in mice, the mice look, when you unload them, they look exactly the same phenotypically. But if you stress them, they then decompensate, and then the mice die, and the ventricles fail. So just structure and function alone, I don't think is going to be enough. Will strain rate imaging be in informative here? I don't know, but it's a very sensitive way of picking it up. I don't think that serial myocardial sampling is feasible. And I'm just going to throw this out there um, based on some studies we've done that are unpublished but are about to be submitted. Uh, might we use uh, proteomics uh, to do this? And, and I'm just going to, most people roll their eyes when I say proteomics, but this is actually doable today in your own backyard. So there's a company called Somalogic, which has developed these protein platforms. This is a 1300 protein chip. They also have a 5K chip. People are beginning to use this. This is commercially available. And the concept here is that there are these DNA aptamers. These are just single strand DNA that's uh, bent back on itself. But the shape of the aptamer can bind to specific proteins, and so they're able to come up with a relatively high throughput way of measuring 5,000 proteins uh, all at the same time. Now, the bad part is it won't give you a quantitative level. It's not like a BNP. You can say it's 100 units, but it will allow you to compare relative protein levels. So on the slide I'm going to show you next, if there's no difference between sample A and sample B, uh, it'll show up uh, as, a, as a gray bar. If, on the other hand, a group of proteins, let's say, in heart failure with a reduced EF is increased, it'll show up as red, let's say, compared to a heart failure preserved ejection fraction. Or if it's decreased, it'll show up as blue. So now you can do this with 5,000 different proteins uh, and a single blood draw. It's kind of amazing. So we've been doing this to kind of study this concept of recovery. And what we've done is to look at, uh, in our own database, we had uh, serum samples from uh, patients with heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction, heart failure with a preserved ejection fraction, and then heart failure with mid-range EF. And that mid-range group, as you all know, is very heterogeneous, and it's comprised of people whose EFs uh, have recovered on medical therapy and also people whose EFs have uh, decreased, uh, very small, and then a group of people who just have always been mid-range EF. And you can see here, just using the somalogic uh, scan, uh, that there's a tremendous amount of uh, differences in the, the heart failure mid-range EF when you compare it to heart failure reduced EF. Uh, and, and the thing that's really intriguing is that this mid-range EF, uh, which is improved, is completely distinct. These are, again, PCA plots now shown in three dimensions, so they look a little different. But the concept here is that this EF is exactly the same as, the, as this EF. The size is the same, and yet what you're reading out uh, in the serum uh, is completely different. Now, could something like this be used to identify a recovery uh, portfolio uh, peripherally on top of structure? I don't know, um, but, but it's not just sort of, you can do this today, you can do this, um, uh, 5,000 proteins are a lot better than the 1,300. But the concept here, I think, is that we might be able to begin to fine tune our ability to unload patients and do this in a collaborative way, really, and try to come up with ideal set points.
So this is my last slide. Um, go back to the chicken and the egg. It turns out both the chicken and the egg really are both right. I think if you look at um, uh, how we give drugs, you get reverse remodeling first, uh, uh, and then that unload, the ventricle gets smaller, and that leads to hemodynamic unloading. Obviously, if you're using circulatory assist devices, <clears throat> then you're unloading first and the biology is uh, following. But I, I, I think we're at a point now in the field where we have enough understanding uh, that we can begin to approach um, <clears throat> this concept of using hemodynamic load to reverse remodel ventricles and do it more than phenomenologically, but do it actually biologically. And I'd be really interested in the discussion that follows. Thanks again for the invitation. And Dan, thanks for the kind introduction. Thank you. Thank <clears> you. <throat> Thank <laughs> you.